introduction and thank you for inviting me to give a talk today. Um, I intentionally chose the title Defective Armenian specifically to play on the ambiguity of the word um, Armenian in English because we can interpret it as Hayeden or Hai and I hope uh, throughout the lecture it'll make more sense. Okay, here we go. Quote, excruciating. That's a rough description of what should be a pleasant adventure of discovering the wondrous essence of your being. Or, this is supposed to be fun, not painful. But it is. It is painful when you're trying to eke out words in Armenian, torturing yourself so foreign verbiage doesn't invade your speech, lest you become complicit in perverting the language you are struggling to maintain. And alas, better? And alas, your fellow interlocutor is more concerned with highlighting your inadequate fluency and naturally their superior usage ability, their impeccable reprimands infused with ishte and yani, than with acting as a guide toward the realization of ostensibly both your goal. The concluding recommendation being, you can say it in English, or if especially audacious, switching languages on you without notice, thus surreptitiously opining about the inferior quality of your spoken work. This proclamation from the same person, who is likely a steadfast source of the righteous imposition that Bedke Hayeren Hoseng, we must speak Armenian, Imagine the state of your brain as it is trying to compute someone telling you that you must speak Armenian while telling you that if you can't manage, and it's obvious you can't, just switch to the other language that they, since they're more multilingual than you, can understand just as well. Instances like these may very well be the beginnings of bipolarity." End quote. This is a piece from William Bayramian's Hosin Kayeden, or you can say in English in Haiduk magazine. As the example that I just read highlights, this presentation will explore the persistent and debilitating anxiety connecting with speaking Armenian among heritage speakers and the destructive cycle that it generates. I will demonstrate that constant teasing, ri uh, ridicule, error correction, and criticism by more proficient speakers in the family and the wider community lead to internalized feelings of incompetence, shame, and fear of judgment when speaking Armenian. As a result, in order not to risk disapproval and harsh reprimands, heritage speakers either avoid interaction in Armenian or prefer to switch to English, reducing the possibility of attaining a high quality and quantity of input. This creates a vicious cycle that perpetuates an inability to further develop proficiency in the heritage language. I will analyze this phenomenon and each of the components in this cycle throughout the presentation. In addition to this first layer of shame for lacking proficiency in Armenian, there is a second degree of shame for their subsequent inability to fulfill the responsibility of transmitting Armenian heritage through the language. Particularly for a diasporic community like the Armenian one, there are very powerful preservationist ideologies that position language transmission as a moral obligation to ensure survival. This presentation will explore the debilitating effects of shame on Armenian heritage language speakers by demonstrating how both stunt heritage language development in different ways. Take a listen to the following short answer responses from Armenian students in a national survey on heritage language learners conducted by the National Heritage Language Resource Center at UCLA, asking students to relate an experience in school, home, or neighborhood involving the use of Armenian. And I quote, my heritage language has never really caused a problem. The only time it becomes an issue is when I try to speak it, particularly with those who speak it much better than I do. It's hurtful when others harass you for speaking the same language differently. My heritage language is weak because we do not speak it much at home. That is why I'm taking these classes at UCLA. Next one. My heritage language became a problem when my peers started to tease me about my dialect. I mix a bit of Eastern Armenian from Armenia and Eastern Armenian from Iran because my parents are from different countries. This made it difficult for me to be comfortable speaking in my heritage language amongst my peers, so for a long time, I wouldn't. There have been several cases where I felt embarrassed to speak when someone's skills are more advanced than mine. Therefore, I did not speak. 
Instances with my family have been really moments of tests for me. So sometimes I feel embarrassed and sometimes I feel proud, depending on how well I use the language. But the other day I was conversing with one of my older cousins and she complimented me on the level and improvement of my Armenian. It felt really good. But sometimes I get stuck, especially when debating an idea with my dad and begin speaking English to get my point across. And that makes me feel embarrassed. I was ridiculed once by a very old man at work for explaining something in Armenian. Many individuals in my hometown speak my heritage language, so it is very valuable knowing it. However, as years went by and I stopped learning my heritage language, it became hard to communicate with it. Knowing that I was speaking incorrectly made me embarrassed, and I became less willing to communicate in my heritage language, and at times avoided this. This also contributed to me forgetting how to speak in my heritage language. Here I would like to provide an outline of my presentation. I will first discuss the sources of my data. Then I will clarify and expand some of the terminology I will be using, as well as introduce prominent theories of language acquisition, which will function as my conceptual framework for this study. And finally, I will discuss the results and implications of my research. This presentation is based on my doctoral research with heritage language speakers of Eastern Armenian. The primary source of data was the collection of audio recorded interviews with a series of heritage language learners selected on a voluntary basis. The interviews were conducted in Armenian with the understanding that participants would attempt to communicate in the heritage language to the best of their ability using English when they deemed it necessary to ensure comprehension. Each interview was about 45 minutes in length and consisted of questions related to background, education, use of, and attitude toward the heritage language. While guided questions were used to frame the overall topics, all interviews were carried out in an open-ended and informal manner, allowing for various directions, elaborations, and spontaneous introduction of new topics. The entire corpus of interviews was transcribed following established research and transcription conventions. Numerous passages from the interviews have been incorporated in this presentation, not only to provide concrete supporting evidence, but also to supplement the narrative analysis of data with human voices. I will read the passages, if you don't mind, in the original Armenian as they were recorded and transcribed, including all of the genuine features of the participant's speech, and provide the accompanying English translation via PowerPoint. Although translating spoken interactions is quite challenging, I have attempted to capture the authenticity of the speaker's speech as much as possible. In the translations, words that were originally uttered in English have been bolded with bracketed glosses of relevant or non-standard grammatical features, which have been included in italics. Under the translation of each passage, an identifying marker is included in the following manner. You'll see the initials of the speaker, age at the time of interview, place of birth, age and immigration, and any other relevant information. At this point, I'm sure some of you are wondering what I mean by heritage language and heritage speaker. A heritage <laughs> language has very unique features that set it apart both from a native language and a foreign language. Unlike foreign language acquisition, heritage language acquisition has its roots in the home, whereas traditionally foreign language acquisition is set in the classroom. In terms of order of acquisition, a heritage language is typically first for an individual, but is incompletely acquired due to a switch to another dominant language. And finally, a heritage language has particular family relevance and or personal connection for the individual. For the purposes of this project and for most scholars in the field of heritage language education, a heritage language speaker is someone who is raised in a home where a non-English language is spoken, who speaks or at least understands the language, and who is to some degree bilingual in that language and English, in our case, Armenian and English. For more recent immigrants, heritage learners belong to the 1.5 generation, which represents those who were born in the host country and have learned the heritage language from many sources, such as family members, peers, and even sometimes through formal education. Many other heritage language learners, classified as second or third generation, were born in the host country, in our case the US, and have come to interact with the heritage language intermittently and primarily through immediate family members. The amount of exposure to the heritage language differs widely from one learner to another, as some have very limited input from the environment, such as sole contact with non-English speaking grandparents, 
while others use it on a daily basis in speaking with parents, watching television programs, and even using the internet in the heritage language. In regards to language use, the overwhelming majority of heritage language learners exclusively use their heritage language up until age five. What happens at age five? The usual age when most children start school in the US. After this, as you can see here, the use of the heritage language naturally experiences a sharp decline with two distinct patterns. Slightly more than half continue to use their heritage language alongside English, while a smaller but significant number use English to the exclusion of their heritage language. The following table is a direct replica of the graphic representation on language use data from the Heritage Language Survey Report. Um, the UCL UCLA has a Heritage Language Resource Center, which is the only language resource center in the United States that focuses on research on heritage language learners. And they conducted a nationwide survey with over 2,000 respondents. And um, some of these statistics are from the survey. It is really important to note that the development of the heritage language and English is very uneven. As children, heritage speakers speak or hear the heritage language at home and in their immediate communities, but with few exceptions, they receive their formal education entirely in English, even children who attend Armenian school. Due to the wealth and diversity of input available in the dominant language, heritage speakers usually develop full literacy and mastery of the complex systems of registers, repertoire, styles, and varieties of English, while the heritage language remains restricted to the home and the heritage language community, used primarily for casual, low-level, informal interactions requiring limited linguistic repertoires. Additionally, the language used in the home is not identical to the literary and prestigious standard considered the official variety of the language used in formal discourse in the home or in the homeland or taught in a language classroom. Heritage speakers are typically only exposed to the features of the language most appropriate for intimate, private, and everyday interactions that take place in the home among family and community members. This encapsulates a narrow range of colloquial registers and styles characterized by the use of limited lexical and syntactic alternatives. To complicate matters even further, the language received in the home and the heritage language community, especially for US-born speakers from immigrant backgrounds, may often be a community variety in contact with English and other varieties of the heritage language that is quite different from the monolingual standards spoken in the homeland or in other diasporic communities. A heritage language undergoes a great degree of change through lexical and structural borrowing because of contact with the dominant language. Considering all of the factors mentioned above, the development of Armenian and English is quite imbalanced. Whereas heritage speakers usually have mastery of English due to access to continuous formal and standardized education, the heritage language remains underdeveloped in comparison. The figure below from Valdez's 2001 article provides a useful visual for the disparities in the linguistic capacity of English and the heritage language among heritage speakers in immigrant communities. As you can see from the graphic representation, in comparison to English, the heritage language is incompletely acquired and contains both stigmatized features due to non-standard or non-prestige home varieties, as well as contact features due to the interaction with English and other varieties of the heritage language. The uneven development of the two languages leads heritage speakers to manifest very different capabilities. Due to the limited and restricted spheres of linguistic exposure, proficiency in the heritage language is difficult to fully develop or maintain. As a result, heritage speakers' ability in their family language often remains stunted and noticeably weaker than their dominant language. I want to talk a little bit about the conceptual framework for today's presentation. In order to present a thorough portrayal of the deleterious impact of what I call shaming heritage speakers for their weak proficiency in their heritage language, an introduction to prominent theories on language acquisition and development will be essential. Linguist Stephen Krashen's influential proposal on second language acquisition and development, commonly referred to as the comprehensible input hypothesis, includes the following five hypotheses, which I will briefly summarize here. The first hypothesis posits that there are two distinct and independent ways of developing competence in a language. 
acquisition, a subconscious and implicit process similar to the way children develop ability in their first language, what we call picking up a language, or many of you say picking it up with the ear, and learning, a conscious, formal, and explicit learning based on grammar and rules. The second hypothesis states that people acquire the rules of language in a predictable order, and it's not necessarily dependent solely by formal simplicity. Some rules tend to come early and others tend to come late. The third hypothesis describes how acquisition and learning are used in language production with the ability to produce language stemming from acquired competence and learned knowledge only serving as an editor or monitor to uh, make corrections. Now the fourth and arguably most important hypothesis argues that the only way human beings acquire language is by understanding messages. That is, by receiving comprehensible input. And this is a quote from Krashen. We progress along the natural order by understanding input that contains structures at our next stage. Structures that are a bit beyond our current level of competence. We move from I, our current level, to I plus one, the next level along the natural order, by understanding input containing I plus one. We are able to understand language containing unacquired grammar with the help of context, which includes extra-linguistic information, our knowledge of the world, and previous acquired linguistic competence. Now, the two corollaries to this fourth hypothesis propose that with sufficient comprehensible input, speaking will naturally emerge. It cannot be taught directly. And if the input is understood, the necessary grammar will be automatically provided. The final hypothesis, critically important for the arguments developed in this presentation, maintains that in order to fully process comprehensible input, the acquirer needs to be open to the input and not on the defensive. Affective filters, such as lack of motivation and self-confidence, or high anxiety about weaknesses being revealed, function as mental blocks preventing acquirers from fully utilizing the comprehensible input they receive. In other words, the filter is down when the acquirer is not concerned with the possibility of failure in language acquisition, and when he or she considers himself or herself to be a potential member of the group speaking the target language. As Krashen suggests, the five hypotheses can be synthesized into a single claim. People acquire second languages only if they obtain comprehensible input and if their affective filters are low enough to allow the input in. When the filter is down and appropriate comprehensible input is presented, acquisition is inevitable. All five hypotheses reviewed above are significant to the understanding of the processes that shape language acquisition and development, both in the case of first and second language acquisition and undoubtedly for heritage language development, which falls somewhere along the continuum. As will be demonstrated in the remainder of this presentation, the constant anxiety and fear of judgment associated with interacting in the heritage language produces extremely high affective filters that reduce the impact of comprehensible input. Furthermore, and even more damaging, the fear of criticism leads speakers to avoid interactions with more competent speakers who are the richest sources of comprehensible input, thereby reducing the opportunities of improving and developing their proficiency in the heritage language. Now that we're armed with the proper terminology and conceptual framework, take a look at the graphic representation in this visual cycle I have captured. Let us look at all of the individual elements. I don't know if you can read. Is it too small? Okay. The top middle circle says teasing and ridicule, which leads to fear of judgment and criticism, which leads to less interaction in the heritage language with more competent speakers, which leads to less comprehensible input in the heritage language, which leads to less opportunities to develop the heritage language, which then opens you up to more teasing and ridicule, and the vicious cycle sustains itself. So we're going to focus on the top circle, teasing and ridicule. As a result of the limited comprehensible input and opportunities for the development of the heritage language in a typical immigrant setting, 
Heritage speakers often produce speech riddled with non-standard elements in phonology, morphology, register, and semantics. I'm sure you've all experienced this with children or grandchildren. One of the major contrib contributing factors to the anxiety that heritage speakers constantly experience when speaking the heritage language is the explicit display of these errors for public scrutiny by more proficient family and heritage language community members, often done in good humor. From a very young age, heritage speakers, especially those born in the US, recount memories and experiences of being teased for their cute or funny Armenian, often growing up as the butt of many jokes. Speakers describe being called on by parents to repeat an erroneous phrase or a word in front of guests for entertainment, resulting in giggles and laughs from everyone. Although family members probably view these instances of teasing as innocent jokes, the selected responses that I will share with you demonstrate that being singled out as the source of ridicule undoubtedly takes a toll on speaker's self-esteem and willingness to engage in future communication in the heritage language. And the funny thing is that often the errors that heritage speakers make, especially when they're young, aren't typical heritage errors. They're typical errors that children who acquire a first language make. For example, typical Eastern Armenian child would say, yes, see, right, instead of yes, geda. Well, all children who pick up a first language, even who pick up English, will say something like, I eat it. That's a very normal error, right? You pick a pattern and you don't uh, learn the irregulars. But it becomes especially problematic with heritage speakers. A respondent remarked on feeling uncertain about the value of her parents' seemingly positive comments about her Armenian as an American-born Armenian. So I will read the quotes in the original Armenian, and I have the translations on the slides for you. Okay, so I'm asking. Urish vore me mi nech kabor an hagis tez zgum yef ol hayren es khosum. Mek mek ent ani ki het vore ven nef kasen vay sirem ko hayren. Yef chikitam asum en vore tev lavem khosum vore pes mek vore Amerika yu men zamvel te ent hara pes aha vore mi hayren en khosum. Similarly, in response to where and with whom she feels uncomfortable speaking Armenian. Another respondent communicated her realization of having an ugly accent because of friends and family bringing it through to her attention through teasing. Ha, okay, definitely Like, I don't know why. And like, it sounds so ugly. Frequently, unfamiliar community members will not hesitate to point out an error made by a younger speaker, openly displaying their disapproval. In the example next, a heritage speaker narrates an experience during a visit to a chiropractor in which her lacking abilities in register were brought forth leading to her realization that her Armenian is in need of improvement, particularly with older people as they get angry. Mi kani tari araj gnatselen chiropractor imot. Heto asets barev zez vonsek, yeset aseti lavev du vonsez. Meket shurek av asets vonsek, yeset asne hink darek ane aseti esi chichgai na tzavez marta. Heto papa e shurek aseti, bai zinka mi hat marta, e chi piti asem ek. I realized what the already the higher and sound, especially with people older, because you don't try not to like this. So you understand, she understood the singular and plural of the Armenian verb to be, but she didn't understand the formality element, right? That it can also be applied to an individual for whom we need to show respect. Okay. The constant attention to their mistakes causes an additional barrier in heritage speakers' attempts to interact in the heritage language. As another participant perceptively observed, no, one's, no one likes doing something they're not good at. The continuous criticism and ridicule, often with no malice on the part of family members and peers, creates an internalized sense of incompetence and inability. In the example below, or next, a participant shared the embarrassment she experiences at the possibility of being compared to the children of family friends who have much higher proficiency in Armenian. In response to where and with whom she feels uncomfortable speaking in Armenian, she responded, Again, head, like family friends, yet 
Like hold up, Iran's electric generally love and hire and host some who had to yes and bear on his back some who channels them. Often, the risk of ridicule looms as a persistent threat during interactions in the heritage language. One participant directly stated the reasons behind her fear of speaking Armenian in public. Quote, if you say something wrong, they laugh at you. Or even worse, it turns into a joke. The innocent teasing during childhood often transforms into overt error correction or criticism as speakers grow older and are considered fully competent members of the community. Whereas family and community members view the blunders of children attempting to speak Armenian as harmless opportunities for teasing, the deficiencies of adult speakers warrant direct error correction, criticism, and even admonishment. More proficient community members earnestly believe that as Armenians, heritage speakers should know and speak their heritage language fluently, in other words, like a native speaker. As a result, participants experience a recurrent appearance of language policing, during which parents frequently interrupt them to correct their errors, relatives and family friends explicitly comment on their mistakes, and even reprimand them for not knowing better Armenian. This group of critics sometimes includes Armenian teachers, who place much higher standards on their heritage students in language classrooms. A few participants recounted the harsh evaluations and criticism they received from instructors about the broken or parochial Armenian they speak. Predictably, due to the lack of access to a high quality and quantity of comprehensible input in the heritage language and the social context to use it, heritage speakers' ability remains underdeveloped. Yet, unfortunately, community members tend to hold speakers to higher standards. Just this quarter, I had a class where I have 35 students, and I asked them about this subject, and so many of them said, I feel so embarrassed that I can't write a research paper in Armenian. But where would they have learned to write a research paper in Armenian? Or I would never be able to give this presentation in Armenian. How should they have been able to do that? The research shows that it takes native-speaking children, K through 12, to pick up academic skills in English. And these kids are only exposed to such limited input in Armenian. Where should they be able to produce that? The next circle I want to talk about is the fear of judgment. As a result of the recurrent scrutiny of their errors and deficiencies, heritage speakers often develop debilitating affective filters. So these can be low self-confidence, a fear of making mistakes, and fears of judgment when interacting in the heritage language, particularly when they gauge that the interlocutor has much stronger proficiency. A widespread series of evaluations, concerns, and fears stood out in the thorough analysis of speakers' interviews about the anxiety-ridden internal process they go through during the linguistic encounters with better skilled Armenian speakers. The following stages, though not necessarily in consecutive order, were persistently present in speakers' responses. So this is what happens when a typical heritage speaker is in an interaction with a speaker that they perceive has higher proficiency. Number one, assess proficiency of interlocutor in comparison to one's own. Two, evaluate the interlocutor's proficiency as higher, better, stronger. <coughs> Three, worry about the interlocutor noticing or calling out one's errors. Four, agonize about the interlocutor judging one for lacking proficiency and even sometimes lacking intelligence. Next, become extremely nervous and anxious about the interaction. Begin speaking poorly and make more errors than usual. Become even more apprehensive and frightful about the interaction. Become uneasy about future interactions. You see how the cycle feeds itself. Because you're so worried about speaking properly, you actually start speaking more improperly. And you start producing more errors, which makes you even more nervous. The steps that I just outlined demonstrate that heritage speakers are constantly in the process of evaluating their own proficiency in comparison with the interlocutors. Once the interlocutor is assessed as having stronger linguistic abilities in the heritage language, the anxiety over being judged and failing puts heritage speakers on the defensive, creating extremely high affective filters that cause the heritage speaker to stumble more and therefore feel more apprehensive. In the following exchanges, speakers convey the full scope of the anxieties connected with the fear of airing in front of more skilled interlocutors, particularly with those who are older and or unfamiliar. Okay. Anhangist, 
բոլորի, ովոր ինձանից ավելի լավ գիտի։ Եթե որինակ լինի մեր դասարանի ընկերուհի ի հետ, նա կերուհու ընկերուհի ի, շատ հանգիստ կարող եմ խոսալ, բայց եթե լինի մեկ անձանոտ կամ ավելի բարցեր պաշտոնով, արդեն ընտեղ դժվարանում եմ, ինչու ես դժվարանում, ինչու ես անհանգիստը զգով, որ սխալան եմ։ Որտեղ եվ ում հետ ես անհանգիստ բացի ես տեղից, ուրիշ որ տեղ ես անհանգիստը զգում, էլի մեծ ահասակների հետ, որոնք հասկանում են ու ճաջ են անումքո հայերենը։ Ակե, նեկս ուան։ Որ տեղ եվ ում հետ ես հանգիստ զգում, երբ հայերեն ես խոսում, I don't know, հայրենս այդ կան լավ չի, սո այդ ես իրանց հետ ավելի հանգիստ եմ խոսում, լայք նույն նախադարսթյունը կարամ ասենք ձեզ հետ խոսամ և սաղ սխալ ստացվի, սո այդ ունով, որ հանգիստ եմ ավելի համեն լավ եմ խոսում, Ինչու ես անհանգիսկում, որով հետև ես լավ չեմ խոսում, so I don't know, it's ոնց որ գիտեմ, սխալ եմ խոսում, բայց այդ կան էլ չէ գիտեմ, որ ճիշտ խոսամ, you know, I know I speak wrong, but I don't know enough, so I can speak properly. Next one. Ոկ, որտեղ եմ ում հետ ես հանգիսկում, երբ հայրեն ես խոսում, տան մեջ տան մեջ, ինչու ես հանգիս տան մեջ, իմանում եմ, որ իմ հայրենը շատ պակուր չի, կամ շատ պրապր չի, բայց տան մեջ չեմ վոգես անում, որ պրապր խոսամ, ավելի հանգիս ծնողներիս հետ, կամ եթե կրոչ ես հետ, բայց եթե ավելի ծնողներիս հետ, եթե գնամ որինակ է կերուհի ստան մեջ, իրա ծնողների հետ ստիպված հայրեն եմ խոսում, բայց այդ վաղթ ենքան եմ լայք դժվարանում, որտեղ անձ անոտ եմ, ուզում եմ ամեն ինչ ճիշտ ասեմ։ Many respondents reveal the discomfort and tension that envelopes them when speaking in Armenian precisely because of the fear that the interlocutor with higher proficiency will immediately notice and call them out on their errors and poor Armenian. Below, a speaker expressed the intense pressure involved in communications with relatives who are native speakers and can potentially notice her errors. Shat dishbara inzi. Nuinisk bare kamner vor yete shat hajak chem des nu mirens. Բայց գիտեմ, որ մի այն հայրեն են խոսում, ես շատ եմ դժվարանում իրենց հետ հայրեն խոսալուց, որտև ինչ-որ մի երևի լայք ոնց պացատրեմ, պրեշր եմ ուզգում, ոնց որ չեմ ուզում սխալվեմ ու դրանից ավելի շատ եմ սխալվում ու ինձ թվում ա նկատում են իրոք, որով հետև կանի որ դե հայերեն է իրանց շատ վարժ են հայերենից, ընդեղ են մեծացել, սովորել, կամ որ իրանց մտքով չի անցնի, որ մարդ կարա ես ինչ բան է, ինչ-որ սխալ ասի, սո իրանց համար � հոքր սխալունքները, դրա համար միշտ է ձև մայք դժվար այնձի, որ մտածում եմ հեսա մի սխալ բանք ասեմ։ Similarly, the following speakers express their concerns about speaking Armenian in front of a group of interlocutors with better proficiency. Yeah, երբ որ լայք խումբի առաջ եմ հայր են խոսում, եվ հատ կապես, որ իմա� Երբ որ իմանում եմ, որ կարող են յունով սխալնել ես, յունով իմանում են, երբ մի բան սխալ եմ ասում։ Ըկ է, սո ինչու ես անհանգիսկում, որով հետև կարծում ես կո սխալները կնկատել, որտև իմանում եմ սխալ եմ ասում
իսկ որտեղ երկում հետ ես անհանգի ստզգում, երբ հայերեն ես խոսում։ Երևի դասի մեջ, որով հետև ավելի շատ աչկեր ու ականչներ իմ վրա են։ Եվ իրանք լավ էլ գիտեն, կիմանան, երբ ճիշտ եմ ասում կամ շատ some heritage speakers astutely remark that people assess not only their language, but also their intelligence based on their linguistic competence. As a result, they voice anxieties that interlocutors will judge them as less intelligent based on lacking proficiency in Armenian. This strong sense of fear of judgment is communicated in the following examples. Amanchumem vor hayeren eshat ins tvumats hazer makardakia. Ոնց որ ասեցի բարեկամներից հետ շատ ժամանակ վարջ չեմ խոսում։ Ու իրան գիտեն, որ ես խելացի եմ, բայց երևի ինձ միշտ թվում աթե մի կողմից կարողա կասկածել, որով հետև մարդկանց ասեն գիտելիքները շատ ժամանակ խոս to better communicate, ավեն շատ մարդկանց հետ եմ կարող խոսել, եթե իրանց լեզուն հասկանում եմ, I don't know, երբ որ ավեն լավ ես խոսում, people take you more seriously. The apprehension of judgment along with the pressure of error creates an intimidating sense of anxiety when interacting in the heritage language. In the following excerpt, a speaker movingly incorporated a physical metaphor for the debilitating effects of an internalized sense of inability and helplessness. Vortech yev kum het es anhangist, yev ichu es anhangist es kum. Asenk barekamneri het, barekamneri het em, asenk yervor hyura galis, uuzum et vor bacadrem inch hov es bavum, et jamanak dishvar et galis ins hamar, sens vons vor lezus mega brnela, u chit hov mun vor khos es gites, aim in sens dishvar et ins hamar. It's like someone has a hold of my tongue and won't let it go for me to speak. What a powerful physical metaphor. As the examples above illustrate, speakers are persistently inflicted with affective filters such as fear of failure, lacking self-confidence, and apprehension of judgment that are constantly up because of the high levels of stress and anxiety involved during interactions in Armenian these affective filters function as mental blocks, not only obstructing the reception of comprehensible input, but also impeding the speaker's ability to perform at their potential. Due to the amplified fears and pressures associated with performing in front of more competent speakers, heritage speakers, not surprisingly, feel most comfortable interacting in Armenian with those whom they perceive to have equal or lower proficiency. Speakers repeatedly reported feeling secure speaking in Armenian only with those peers whom they observed to be just as bad, just as poor, just as broken, if not worse than theirs, as this would eliminate the fear of criticism and judgment. As one participant explained, he's comfortable speaking Armenian with his peers because, quote, I think that I speak wrong, so maybe they speak wrong as well. Or as another speaker explained, she only feels relaxed interacting in Armenian with her close friends because they all speak poorly and she does not feel bad during the interaction. In the following excerpt, a speaker explains the difference in stress levels between airing in front of his friends who will most likely not even perceive the presence of a mistake and his girlfriend's parents with whom the stakes of making an error are much higher. Oops. որտեղ եմ ում հետ ես հանգիս ծգում, երբ որ հայեր են ես խոսում։ Ըրինակ անին, անին ընկերուհինը։ Իրանց ընողները շատ նա հայեր են են հասկանում, չէ։ Իրանք իմ ընկերներիս հետ ավելի ազատ են խոսում, բայց եթե ինչ, որ մի տեղ, մի փոքրվան սխալ լինի, հաստատ կնկատ են, այսքն ծնողները, կերուղ ու ծնողները կնկատ են, դրա համար ավելի մի կից ենց մտածելով են խոսում, ոտեղից համի կիչ, որ նեղվում են, 
մի բան չի ջոգի, բայց իրանց մող ծնողների մոտ կճշտեն են բան, մի բան, որ սխալ եմ ասել։ In the example below, a speaker relates feeling comfortable interacting in Armenian with a friend whose Armenian is just as poor because she will not incur judgment. Okay, որ դա եվում հետ ես հայր են խոսում, կետ հեն թանուր արմամ նկարագրես, մոր ես հետ, մի հատ պարս կա հեն կերուհի ունեմ, ավելի շատ իրա հետ, ինչու, որով հետևինքը լավանգներ են չգիտի, լավ հայեր են չգիտի, իրա դիմած ավելի հանգիստ է ուսկում, հետո իրատ հասկանում ենք են չեն ուզգում ամպայման պիտի, ամպայման պիտի չիշտ խոսամ հետները, կամ կասեն, ո, այս խալ բարը ոգտագործեց կամ, որևը, որտեղ եվ ում հետ ես անհագիստ ուզգում, երբ որ հայրեն ես խոսում և ինչու, ընանց դիմած, որ շատ լավ են More typically, when a difference in proficiency presents itself among peers, if possible, the simple solution rests in switching to English, a language comfortable for everyone. By default, this process of selection based on a desired ease of interaction typically excludes older native speakers who are most competent in the heritage language and can provide the most comprehensible input. So, language acquisition theory tells us that the only way to improve your language is to be in interaction with people who are at a higher level than you, right? But when you're scared about being judged, the first thing you do is avoid interaction with those people who are your only resource for improving your language. Often, the shift to English is carried out in order to allow for better comprehension and social comfort. In other words, to save the lower proficiency speaker from the taxing atmosphere of struggling to interact in Armenian. Below, speakers describe the decision-making process in switching to English during conversations with low proficiency peers. <laughs> Հտեց իմ տարիքի մարդկանց հետ, մարդիկ որ հայ չեն, իրանց հետ, կամ են որ հայ են, ուզգում են, որ նեղվում են էլ իխոսալուց, ինչ-որ իրանց համար հարմար չի, որ որպեսի ազատ խոսանք, անգլեր են, որ հանգիստ խոսանք էլի, դե որ հետաքրքիր բանա, որ մեր կազինները սաղ հայեր են չեն խոսում, չեն փորձում, որ խոսան սաղորը, դու էլ անհանգիս տես զգում, որը սկսում ես հայեր են խոսալ, որտև իրանք չեն ոգտագործում, սոպոնց որ սենց ամաչում ես, and he is embarrassed to speak Armenian because he doesn't know if he's going to insult his cousins who don't know how to speak Armenian. չեն ուզում, եթե սխալ ա, սխալ չի, սողտենց էլ դժվարանում ա, իրանք իրանց հետ, որ հայրեն են խոսում, իրանք էլ, որ ուզում են պատասխան են, դժվարանում են, սո անգլերեն են խոսում իրանց հետ, որ իրանք չամա չեն, որ իրանք վատ չզգայն So, I mean, ես ինչ-որ կարամ անում եմ, ուզում եմ իրանց հետ հայրան խոսան, բայց տեսնում եմ, որ դժվար է իրանց համար, այմ իտ հես չի գալիս, ու մանավատ, որ ասենք ծնողներս իրանց հետ են խոսում, հայերեն ու ամեն ինչը So, as demonstrated, the discomfort involved in exchanges between speakers with varying abilities does not only affect speakers with low proficiency. Even the most competent speakers in the study, including a few speakers who arrived to the U.S. in their early teens, revealed that one of the biggest challenges for them during interactions with Armenian friends involves either translating what they have said in Armenian to English or maneuvering a switch to English in order to alleviate the distress of the lower proficiency interlocutor. As one highly competent trilingual participant explained, the choice of language with her friends depends on the most optimal ease of interaction. Again, Neri and Gedui Neri had Nayat. Iran's Hayrene Ichkan. 
շատ եկերներուն է, որտեղ որոնք ստեղ են մեծացել, ստեղ են ծմվել, այդքան իրանց հայերենը լավ չի, ավելի շատ անգլերեն են խոսում, բայց եկերներ ունեն, որ հետները շատ ազատ հայերեն են խոսում, կան նաև, որ մենակ ուսերեն են խոսում, հայերեն անգլերեն էդ կան լավ չի գիտեն, համասարան բնականաբար հիմնականում անգլերեն են խոսում, նույնիսկ եթե Additionally, as I'm sure you're all aware as fellow Angelinos, the multiplicity of Armenian linguistic variants present in this community, namely Western Armenian, Eastern Armenian, and the Iranian Armenian dialects, frequently enhances difficulties, perceived and real, in comprehension, speaking, and a sense of fitting in, leading either to a lack of interaction in the heritage language or a prompt switch to English. As iterated in Krashen's hypothesis, a sense of fitting in and potential group membership contributes strongly to improved language acquisition and development. The diversity of linguistic variants in this community causes an extra source of distress for heritage speakers who already have internalized complexes about their abilities in their home variety. In situations of contact with interlocutors of another background, speakers face an even more tasking challenge of interacting in an additional variety of the language and risking their prospective membership of the group. In the following example, the speaker discusses her inability to fit in during her teenage years because of her mixed linguistic features as a result of coming from a family of Iranian-Armenian descent that initially immigrated to Armenia and then to the U.S. Menkvor pokerink, not poker, but like das yerek darekan. Իմ ընկերումները շատ հայաստանցի էին գլետելում, եմ իմ խոսատուծևը տարբեր էր, բիքս ես պարսկահայ մի կիչ ակցենտ ունեմ, ու բարերը վրբերը կամ էս եմ անում, են եմ անում, իրանցից մի կիչ տարբեր, սո իրանք միշտասում են Սո ես լայն դրանից հետո տաս երեկ տաս չորս տարեկանից հետո այլ չեի սիրում հայր են խոսե, որով հետև չի գիտեի լայք ում հետ ոնց խոսամ, կամ ակսենտ սպոխ եմ, կամ չպոխ եմ։ Just a week ago, an Iranian Armenian student at UCLA told me that she got teased so much that at some point she made a decision to stop speaking Armenian, and then when she came to UCLA and joined the ASA, everyone called her the whitewashed one because she never spoke Armenian. And actually, she has very high Armenian proficiency. This experience demonstrates that strict linguistic boundaries that young people may impose on their peers in order to be granted access to membership to a group. The inability to meet those standards may discourage certain potential members from pursuing communication in the heritage language and instead only enhance their sense of inability and fear. When faced with interactions with another variant, some speakers, particularly those of Iranian-Armenian background, experience dialect shame adding another layer of anxiety to the, equi to the existing equation already riddled with fears. In the following example, a speaker of Iranian-Armenian background conveys the embarrassment of her own dialect and her frustration during interdialectal interactions. Okay. So I asked them, reading, writing, speaking, listening, which one would you want to improve? որ ուրիշի տունն եմ գնում, իրանք որ հետս խոսում են, մի բար չգիտեմ, կա մամա չում եմ, կա որ մամաս պապաս, որ բարսկաստանից են, իրանց բարերը, իմ բարերը մի կիչ ուրիշակ հանց թե գնաս ուրիշ տեղ խոսաս, կասեն ո, Iranian Armenian interacting with the Gyumri Armenian. Եվ իրանք, որ իմ հետ խոսեն, մի անգամիշ չեմ կարող անում հետ պատասխաներ, ինչ որ ասեն կծի ծաղան։ Out of her nerves, he just starts laughing. Շատ դժվար է իմ համար, ու որ հայերը ունեն արսկա հայեր լնականցի էտի ահավոր Եթե պարսկահայ լիներ ընկերես, կամ մի քիչ ինքնել տեսնեմ էլ կամ բարցր ձևի չի խոսում, հանգիստ խոսայ։ In the following case, an Eastern Armenian speaker describes her discomfort during interactions with an older community member who speaks community member who speaks another Armenian, in this case Western Armenian. Որտեղ եկում հետս անհանգիստ սկում, երբ որ հայերն ես խոսում, 
I think Hamutnerum, I'm like Udish Azgi Hayat. She means Udish Spurkain Hamai Kitskan, Udish Talbela Koso. U Zesmi Ban and Hartsunum, like Chem has come Jish. Like me, I come in Horakuir's head, Horakroch's head, Ganatele, Kazanis, Nagara, Belka, Framey, Mech the name. Umata Hartsunum, like Aberikate, but Chem has come, or the Nets like Hayat and a sober Cheida. So, like, what this is going to be a good So, Morkura, Morkura became Morkura. Morkura, Belkagara said, Belkagara said, Hedomadatum is like, Wow, you saw Morkoye de Hanere. I'd like this car on a little bit. What's happening? This example provides insight into the range of emotions experienced by the speaker, beginning with the acknowledgement that the interlocutor is speaking Armenian followed by the embarrassment associated with not understanding the seemingly simple input from an older person and resorting to comprehension repair from the aunt and concluding with concerns about how future generations will deal with this type of communication breakdown. As evidenced by the examples that I just stated, fears and anxieties connected with performing up to par in the heritage language, whether with more competent interlocutors or those who speak another variety, press heritage speakers either to avoid interactions in Heritage language or seek for the quickest opportunity to switch to English. As one speaker formulated, all the unease associated with interacting in Armenian leads to the following typical outcome. Yet has shot matka, usually Anglerena. Chem manumi chumish tensa statsmul, or mir guhovut zavela, Anglerena statsmul kosak. Ultimately, in interactions with two or more participants, due to differences in proficiency levels and or varieties, English functions as the common denominator, resulting in a group of Armenian-speaking Armenians choosing to speak in English for better comprehension and social ease. A group of Armenian-speaking Armenians who choose to speak in English. In the analysis of speakers' emotional and psychological state during interactions in the heritage language, what stands out is the relentless sense of unease over being criticized and judged. For many heritage speakers, interactions in Armenian, especially with better skilled speakers, function like an endless guessing game in which they are persistently in fear of being caught. The energy and effort required for constant monitoring, both of the interlocutor's proficiency and impending judgment, in addition to one's own perceived and or real imminent errors and failures, take a daunting toll on speakers' self-confidence, motivation, and desire to pursue future interactions. It comes as no surprise, therefore, that in almost every single interview, speakers preface their comments and narratives with an unprovoked acknowledgement of their bad, poor, lacking, broken, backward, illiterate, childlike, unsophisticated Armenian, and subsequent apologies for their mistakes as a manner of protecting themselves from the anticipated judgment and criticism. Literally, every interview would start like this, we hadn't started the interview, right? And I never asked them about their proficiency, but they constantly felt the need to preface the interactions with apologies. Furthermore, this internalized sense of lacking competence and ability among heritage speakers creates a pronounced aspiration for normalcy, automaticity, propriety, fluency, and ease in the heritage language. As the examples below convey, respondents long not to stand out for their marked inability as awkward, funny, someone with an accent, or someone who stutters and stumbles, but instead to effortlessly fit in as a fully normal and competent speaker. <laughs> even though literature name, it's like they wouldn't be able to detect an accent or anything. So the interesting thing is that when you ask heritage speakers to rate their skills, the four skills, right? Speaking, listening, reading, and writing. Which one do you think they rate the highest as speaking? But when you ask them which one do you want to improve most, you assume it should be literacy because they already have good command of speaking. They all say they want to improve speaking. Yeah? Um, Okay, next one. Kes hamat kare bore hayer ni managa. Ayo, inchu markans het vor shpfum em kare nam het nere norman khosam. 
իրար հասկանանք, Հայաստան գնալուց ակվորդ չլինի, տարորինակ չլինի։ Ըքե, այդ չորսից ամենաշակը որը ուզեն այր զարգացնել, խոսել, ինչու, Այս շորսից որը կուզեն այր զարգացներ ամենաշատը, խոսել ես, խոսել ես, իչու, անկեղծորեն, որով հետև էրեխային ուման եմ խոսում, որտև ստարեր, ստաբով, չեմ կարող անում սահում խոսամ, իվն դոգ արող եմ in which standard Armenian remains a desired but often unachievable goal, while the heritage variety functions as a defective reality, leaving heritage speakers in the pressure-filled crack between the distant ideal and the devalorized actuality. This persistent and adverse criticism of U.S. heritage speakers, especially by monolingual or heritage language dominant immigrants, has been confirmed in research across languages in the U.S. Carrera, who's a specialist on Spanish as a heritage language, notes that the derisive attitudes about U.S. Spanish represent a particularly serious obstacle to the goal of enhancing students' linguistic self-esteem, which is critical in the process of language development and the formation of positive language attitudes. A review of the detrimental effects such attitudes have on bilinguals reveals that relatives, classmates, and even teachers all contribute in varying degrees to the linguistic inferiority that many bilingual that assails many bilingual heritage speakers, leading to the firm conviction that their spoken variety is faulty and in need of remediation. Often newly arrived immigrants will comment on the unexpected contact phenomena employed by heritage speakers, contributing to a negative ima image of the US language variety. Paradoxically, speakers are criticized for both speaking their heritage language and for not speaking it. So this is what I call the doomed if you do, doomed if you don't scenario. If you try and use your broken Armenian, you are shamed for it not being good enough. If you don't, you are shamed for not being a good enough Armenian. Here, the issue gets more complex. As we reach the next layer of shame associated with heritage speakers' perceived inability to transmit their heritage through the language. For heritage speakers, several prominent affective elements emerged in connection with the significance and value of knowing the Armenian language, all indicating the undeniable link between language and identity and the integral function of language as a central vehicle of cultural preservation and transmission. A very strong degree of what renowned linguist Joshua Fishman labels positive ethno-linguistic consciousness was present comprised of a sense of sanctity, kinship, and moral imperative. The fragile nature of Armenian existence in a diasporic setting with a small worldwide population recurrently stood out as the source for a need to claim and take ownership of their heritage and language. As a result, heritage speakers have internalized a moral responsibility for cultural preservation accompanied by a concurrent fear of loss of their heritage in light of the visible assimilation they witness around them. The awareness of a dispersed Armenian existence and the internalized moral obligation of claiming and perpetuating the heritage, culture, and language lead to a central belief among Armenian heritage speakers which equates being Armenian with knowing Armenian projecting a conscious understanding that Armenian identity is contingent on knowledge and practice of the language. This is often articulated as a compulsory equivalence in which claiming Armenian identity requires proficiency in Armenian. Despite the strong sentiments outlined above, there are less overt and less obvious language behaviors and attitudes that conflict with the positive attitude and public orientation during, towards Armenian, leading to reduced language use and lower proficiency. Essentially, even though Armenian is given very high symbolic value, it is stripped of its utility and considered to be devoid of any practical or instrumental value. Knowledge of Armenian seems to bear no benefits outside of the emotional and personal realm with no tangible uh, material gains. Most importantly, when viewed as an obstacle to academic advancement, which is naturally centered on English, 
and as such to the accompanying socioeconomic and social mobility, it is deprioritized and devalued. Often the same parents and community members who have socialized their children into such elevated sentiments about the value of knowing Armenian are complicit in the lowering of its status in their day-to-day -day actions and behaviors. But possessing such a close association between language, ethnic identity, and the moral duty of transmission without the necessary linguistic proficiency to justify it can function as a double-edged sword, highlighting many of the inherent contradictions in such paradoxical formulations. In the case of heritage speakers I interviewed, they clearly subscribe to the language and identity ideology, which emphasizes the inherent connection between a person and his or her native or heritage language. However, their lack of high competence in the heritage language does not allow them to fully meet the requirements set by the ideology. Thus, they are keenly aware of the contradiction inherent in the fact that they define an Armenian person as someone who speaks Armenian, and I would argue as someone who speaks Armenian well. And furthermore, they self-identify as Armenian, yet for the most part, they're English dominant. As a result of this inconsistency, there is great tension in claiming full access to Armenian identity due to the lack of the required linguistic proficiency. Often this is presented at the negation of the equation so that the consideration of someone who is Armenian but does not know Armenian well results in of feelings of shame and embarrassment. So their defective hyadin makes them a defective high. In addition to the tensions related to accessing and claiming Armenian identity, divergent language ideologies also lead to a related source of anxiety connected with feelings of guilt and shame, not only for lacking proficiency in Armenian, but also for their subsequent inability to fulfill the moral responsibility of transmitting Armenian heritage through the language. Repeatedly and ubiquitously, heritage speakers expressed an inability to come to terms with the fact that they would be incapable of transmitting Armenian culture, history, language, and all the other features that comprised Armenian heritage to future generations due to their lack of competence in Armenian. And so this is the quote that became the title line of the dissertation. How do I teach my broken Ar how do I teach my kids my broken Armenian? Although the questionnaire that I used for interviews included a question toward the end about speakers' desire to teach their children Armenian, Preceding questions related to the reasons for learning Armenian and or the importance of knowing Armenian consistently elicited responses about the obligation to perpetuate culture across generations. Without ex exception, speakers raised the issue of transmitting their heritage to their children and the anxiety they experience at the possibility of failing to carry out this critically significant moral obligation. There's a lot to say about prioritizing the symbolic value of Armenian over its actual practical use as a tool of communication, but unfortunately we don't have the time today to go into that. So I'm wrapping up, just hang in there. <laughs> uh, the largest contributing factor to breaking this destructive cycle that I presented today involves changing people's attitudes about the processes involved in the acquisition and development of language. Although speakers of any language have very high standards for language and strong feelings about correctness, educating heritage language students and community members about the natural varieties of language, the ineffectiveness of error correction, and the critical role of comprehensible input can serve as foundational steps. Scholars have repeatedly demonstrated that language learning and development cannot succeed in situations that damage the linguistic self-esteem of learners. Therefore, raising community awareness in order to persuade stronger heritage speakers not to ridicule or correct, but to tolerate weak speakers' errors and to encourage interaction in the heritage language can serve as productive means of developing the competence of heritage speakers. The implications of this study highlight the role of the heritage language community members and the impact of their behaviors on the self-esteem and confidence of heritage speakers to use the language. Obviously, family or community members who engage in such actions are not aware of its negative impact. The teasing, judgment, and criticism is certainly not done with malicious intent. On the contrary, more proficient speakers are, quote, shaming heritage speakers in order to encourage or pressure them into speaking Armenian. Therefore, raising awareness about the 
excuse me, this phenomenon may help alter behaviors, particularly in educational settings where the heritage language is taught. For example, we've had a number of workshops with Armenian language teachers about error correction and ways of doing it so it doesn't harm the self-esteem of the learner. Given the difficulty of changing an entire community's perspective on language correctness and best practices during the acquisition and development process, it may be easier to target this problem from the other end by educating heritage speakers about their own sociolinguistic background and linguistic science in general. Helping speakers and learners understand the linguistic legitimacy of their home language, the arbitrary nature of linguistic prejudice, and the inevitability of dialectal variation will help raise the value of heritage languages for individual speakers. That's it. Thank you.